Hey everybody, we're about to wrap up chapter one in the text, but just a few odds and ends that we want to go over before we move on to bigger and better stuff. Uh, first, a couple of identities that uh, may come in handy along the way. An identity for cosine of theta in terms of e to the i and e to the negative i theta. Cosine of theta is e to the i theta plus e to the negative i theta over 2. Sine of theta, e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta over 2i. And uh, to see these, well, let's just prove them. It will take this one first. And we'll recall that e to the i theta is equal to cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. Now, what would happen if I put a negative sign in front of the i here? Well, let's see. e to the negative i theta, I could write that as e to the i times negative theta. And then that would equal cosine of negative theta plus i sine of negative theta. And let me make these things a little bit bigger. Cosine of negative theta, that's a trig identity. Cosine of negative theta is just cosine of theta. And sine of negative theta is negative sine of positive theta. So we have e to the negative i theta is equal to cosine of theta minus i sine theta. So I'll just write that here. Cosine of theta minus i sine of theta. And what would happen if I added these two equations together? Well, I'd get e to the i theta plus e to the negative i theta equals, ah, these two guys cancel each other out. So I get 2 cosine of theta e to the i theta plus e to the negative i theta is 2 cosine of theta. And then if I divide both sides by 2, I'll get e to the i theta plus e to the negative i theta over 2 is equal to cosine of theta. And that's our identity. Cosine of theta e to the i theta plus e to the negative i theta over 2. So that's how we get this identity. Now, for the other one, sine theta, that we have sine theta is equal to 
e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta all over 2i. Sine theta is e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta over 2i. And let's just see how we do that. Uh, actually, we've done all the legwork for this already. Notice what we have in the numerator here, e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta. So what would happen if we subtracted the second line from the first? Let's do that. e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta. Okay, the cosines wipe each other out, and I have i sine theta minus a negative i sine theta. That's 2i sine theta. And then, huh, to get sine theta, I just divide both sides by 2i. So I get e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta over 2i equals sine theta. And unless I've done something catastrophically wrong, that's what we wanted, sine of theta, sine of theta, e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta over 2i. Check, 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 check. Okay. Now, let's just do an example uh, using these identities, uh, just for the heck of it. Sine to the fourth of theta, let's say one eighth cosine or theta minus one half cosine two theta plus three eighths. And just as a, a steering mechanism, suppose they tell us that to use the identity Suppose they give us those instructions. Use the identity sine of theta equals e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta over 2i, the identity that we just proved. Okay. I'm going to keep this up here just to remind us that this is our target. This is what we want to end up with. Okay, we have sine of theta to the fourth power. And we're going to substitute this in for sine theta. 
So e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta over 2i to the fourth. And the way I would reason on this, <clears throat> I would say we have a quotient raised to the fourth power. So we'll raise the numerator and denominator separately to the fourth power. e to the i theta minus e to the negative i theta to the fourth over 2i to the fourth. Hmm. And i to the fourth, what is that? Let's see, i squared is negative one. So i to the fourth is i squared times i squared. That's negative one times negative one. So i to the fourth is just one. And two to the fourth is 16. So we're looking at a, a denominator of 16. And we can use the binomial formula to multiply that out. Or if we know the coefficients already, we can just do it that way. So I'm going to have e to the i theta to the fourth minus 4 e to the i theta cubed times e to the negative i theta plus 6 e to the i theta squared e to the i uh, e to the negative i theta squared minus 4 e to the i theta times e to the negative i theta cubed plus e to the negative i theta to the fourth. And all of this is over 16. Now, if I used this identity for sine theta, I probably want to continue want to continue to use this identity and its counterpart for cosine. Let's say e to the i theta to the fourth, the exponents multiply. So this is e to the i four theta minus. 4, and the exponents multiply, so e to the i times 3 theta times e to the negative i theta plus 6. The exponents multiply e to the i 2 theta. The exponents multiply again e to the negative i 2 theta. Okay, minus 4 e to the i theta, and e to the negative i theta cubed, the exponents multiply, e to the negative i 3 theta, 
plus, okay, the exponents multiply, e to the negative i four theta. And all of this is over 16. I'm running out of blackboard space here or whiteboard space. So I'm going to erase the top two lines and continue my computation. And I'll remind myself that all of this is over 16 so that I don't forget my denominator somewhere along the way. e to the i, 4 theta, I'll leave that alone for right now. These two I can combine. The exponents are going to add i times 3 theta minus i times theta, that's i times 2 theta. So minus 4 e to the positive i 2 theta. Huh, same thing here. The exponents are going to add, I get 0, e to the 0, which is 1. So this is just going to be plus 6. The exponents add here. i theta minus 3i theta is e to the negative i 2 theta. And this guy, I think that I'll leave this guy alone. And again, everything over 16. Oh, I sure hope I haven't copied things down wrong. That would be catastrophic. I think what I want to do now is group powers of e according to multiples of theta. e to the i 4 theta, e to the negative i 4 theta. So I have e to the i 4 theta plus e to the negative i Four theta. Oh, I think I like where this is going. And I'll take powers of two or uh, multiples of two theta, group them together. So I have negative four e to the garbage two theta, negative four e to the negative garbage two theta. e to the i 2 theta e to the negative i 2 theta And then I have remaining 6 over 16. Well, this reminds me of something. This reminds me of the identity cosine of theta is equal to e to the i theta plus e to the negative i theta over 2. 
That's what it reminds me of. Except instead of theta here, I have four theta. So let's, hmm. I'll, do, I'll factor this into one eighth times one half. I'll put the one eighth out here. And I'll keep the one half down here. E to the i four theta plus e to the negative i four theta. Okay. Ah. And you know what? I see the same thing happening here. So I'll take negative four. I'll take an eight away from this 16 and leaves me with a two in the denominator. E to the i two theta. plus e to the negative i to theta, oh, this is going to be good, plus 3 eighths I have one eighth, and according to my formula, this is going to be, well, what was my formula? Cosine of theta equals e to the i theta plus e to the negative i theta over two, right? And this is exactly the same thing as this, except down here, 4 theta is playing the role that theta plays up here. So instead of being cosine of theta, we're going to have cosine of 4 theta. And we have 4 eighths here, that's a half. And this expression reminds me very much of this expression, except down here we have 2 theta playing the role that's played by theta up here. So instead of having cosine of theta, this is going to be cosine of 2 theta. plus 3 eighths. And you know what? This is exactly what we were trying to show. Sine of 4 theta equals 1 eighth cosine 4 theta minus a half cosine 2 theta plus 3 eighths. Bravo. Now, next on our agenda, a little bit of geometry. Okay. <clears throat> Let's look a little bit at the geometry in the complex plane. And take two complex numbers, z1 equals x1 plus y1i and z2 equals x2 plus y2i. What is the modulus of z2 minus z1? Algebraically, we know what it is. Let's see. z2 minus z1 is x2 plus y2i minus x1 
plus y1i So that would be real number x2 minus x1 plus complex number y2 minus y1i and the modulus of z2 minus z1 uh, that's going to be the modulus of real x1 minus, I'm sorry, real x2 minus x1 plus imaginary y2 minus y1. And remember how we get the modulus again? We just square the real part and square the imaginary part and take the square root. So it's going to be real part squared plus imaginary part squared. And then we do the square root. But that does remind me of something, uh, especially if we just consider work that we've done in the xy plane, uh, maybe with a function of two variables, x and y. <laughs> this sure looks like something familiar, doesn't it? Like maybe the distance between x1, y1 and x2, y2? You know, I think so. Well, this distance, x2 minus x1, and this distance, y2 minus y1. Yeah, x2 minus x1, that's the length of the horizontal leg of this right triangle. y2 minus y1, that's the length of the vertical leg of this right triangle. Huh, and the hypotenuse, it is the Oh my, yeah, that's right. The hypotenuse, this is the horizontal leg squared plus the vertical leg squared square root. So modulus of Z2 minus C1 is the distance from 
z1 to z2, or vice versa. You know, I guess this isn't such a surprising result. I should have known what this was going to turn out to be when I started. But now that we know what this is, maybe we can take it a little bit further. You know what? Let me change this. Let me just say R. <clears throat> we know that this is the distance from Z1 to Z2, or vice versa. So what if for a fixed point Z1, we have the modulus of z minus z1 equals r for some given value of r. This is an equation with one variable, z. Okay, let's reason this out. <clears throat> Forget about the R for a second. What is the modulus of Z minus Z1? 
isn't that the distance from Z to Z1 or from Z1 to Z? Okay. So we're looking at complex number Z whose distance from Z1 is equal to R. So the solution of this equation is the set of all complex numbers Z such that the distance from Z1 to Z or from Z to Z1 equals R. Huh. What are we talking about here? What are we talking about here? Here's the point x1, y1, and I go a distance of r in this direction, and a distance of r in this direction, and a distance of r in this direction, in this direction, in this direction, in this direction, in this direction in this direction, in this direction, in this direction, in this direction, and so on and so forth. The values of z, oh, I erased my equation, that figures. The values of z that satisfy this equation are all the complex numbers z that are a distance of r from the point z1. And son of a gun, oh, we know what it is. Did you ever get the impression that when I was a kid, I was one of those kids when I was coloring, I couldn't stay within the lines? Oh, well. Yeah. Here's R, the distance from any point Z to this, this point Z1, X1, Y1. Son of a gun. This is a circle of radius r with center z1. Oh my goodness. Huh. This is the equation of a circle of radius r and center z1. Now we'll look at a couple more things geometrically. Oh, by the way, 
remember this. Uh, later on in the text, but later on in the text, we will be doing exercises that require that we know what this is and that when we see this equation, we know what it is. And it will also require that when we're told there's a circle of radius R and center Z1, we'll know that this is the equation of that figure. Now let's look at a couple more uh, geometric things. Okay, first example. The graph of modulus of z equals r, where r is positive. Well, remember the graph of z minus z1 equal r was a circle of radius 1 and center z1. So is this a circle too? It is. It is a circle. And what is Z1? It's the origin, isn't it? So Circle of radius R centered at the origin. Oops. This is the graph of modulus of z equals r. Another example. Modulus of z less than r. Okay, well, it looks like, ooh, it looks like the perimeter of this circle is the boundary region of the graph of this equation. And we're looking at all complex numbers whose moduli are less than r. So that would be anything whose modulus is less than r. So that's this whole interior of the circle, but not the boundary of the circle. So this is the graph of Z is less than R. Okay. Another example. z greater than or equal to r. Again, our reference is going to be the circle of radius r centered at the origin.
And now we're talking about all complex numbers Z that are a distance greater than or equal to R from the origin. So let's see, it would be points on the outside of this circle, wouldn't it? And this is modulus of Z greater than or equal to R. So the perimeter of the circle is part of the solution to this graph. So we won't make it a dotted line, we'll make it a solid line, showing that the circle itself is part of the solution. And here's what the graph looks like. All complex numbers on or outside the circle. Circle given by the equation modulus of z equals r. And so the graph of modulus of z greater than or equal to r is the set of all points on this circle or exterior to that circle. Okay, let's uh, do one more kind of like this. Yep, I just had to generalize it a little bit. This is a circle of radius r with center at z1 equal x1 plus y1i. And I guess more correctly, I should say the boundary of this region is a circle of radius r center at z1. Okay. So here's z1, and here's my circle. You'll have to forgive me for this circle. Somebody dropped it on its head when it was a little circle and it never recovered. There. And we have modulus of Z minus C1 greater than or equal to R. So the perimeter of the circle is part of the solution of the equation. Uh, we'll color it in. This is a distance of R. We want Z that are a distance of R or greater from Z1. So it would be all z values on or external to this circle. So this is the graph of modulus of z minus c1 greater than or equal to r for some positive value of r. Huh, what can we do now? Completely different example.
Theta 1 and theta 2 are fixed. So, here's theta 1. And let's say this is theta 2. We're looking at all of the angles between theta 1 and theta 2. And notice that theta can be equal to theta 1. So this should be a solid line. Uh, notice, though, that theta is strictly less than theta 2. So this is a dotted line. And any value of theta between theta 1 and theta 2 will be a solution. So here's our graph. Ah, that was easy enough. More graphs. Why quit when you're on a roll, right? Well, let's see, I guess we've already said that, haven't we? For some given value of x1, we want to graph the real part of z. Now, remember... Given that z equals x plus yi, the real part of z equals x. Okay, so we're just looking for all of the complex numbers in the complex plane that have a real value of x1. So we find x1 on the x-axis. And every point on this vertical line, x equals x1 is a solution. Here's the graph. This vertical line. Okay, well, having done that example, we sort of ought to suspect what's coming next. Imaginary part of Z equals Y1. And just as a reminder, for the complex number z equals x plus yi, the imaginary part of z is the coefficient of i, y. So we go to the xy plane, and on the y-axis, we find yi. 
and the line that goes through that point horizontally is the solution. This is the graph of imaginary part of Z equals Y1. We're almost done, but we got a couple more examples. We can build on this. So, let's try this. Imaginary part of Z less than or equal to Y1. So here's the graph, imaginary part of Z equals Y1. And we want the graph of all those complex numbers whose imaginary part, Y, is less than or equal to Y1. So what is that? See, the imaginary part of a complex number z, that's the y value, right? So we're looking for all the complex numbers in the complex plane that have a y value less than y1. So, let's see, here's the origin. So it's going to be all of these points below the line y equal y1. This is the graph of imaginary part of z less than or equal to y1. Okay, another example. Imaginary part of Z greater than, no, let's see, real part of Z, real part of Z greater than X1. Calls for a whole new graph. So here is our XY coordinate system. And we'll find the real part of Z equals X1. Okay, this vertical line passing through the point x1 on the x-axis is the graph of real part of z equals x1. And what we're looking for we're looking for all points in the complex plane that have the real part or the x value greater than x1. So that's going to be all parts to the right of x1. And since this is real part of z greater than x1 and not greater than or equal to x1, the line real part of z equals x1 is not part of the solution, so we make it a dotted line.
And I guess maybe one more example. Okay, real part of z greater than or equal to x1, less than or equal to x2. So in the xy plane, uh, we locate x1 on the x-axis. So here's real part of z equals x1. And we locate x2 on the x-axis. And here's real part of z equals x2. Notice that we have less than or equal and less than or equal. The graphs of real part of z equals x1 and real part of z equals x2 are part of the solution. So we don't use dotted lines, we use solid lines. And the real part of z is between x1 and x2. So our graph looks like this. There. Real part of z greater than or equal to x1, less than or equal to x2. Well, this has been a productive day. I guess it calls for some homework. I'll send some out soon.